medicals good day to all of you so this is bk for you and i am going to continue with the peritoneum so that is we are continuing from the past lecture the previous lecture where we have stopped so in the previous lecture i have discussed about the various basics and general concepts of the peritoneum so what is a peritoneal cavity how actually it is developed from the primitive silomic cavity and then how this cavity is occupied by many organs invaded by many organs and reducing this into a potential space then the two layers of the peritoneum we have discussed that is the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum then the characters of the parietal and the visceral peritoneum we have listed out then we have discussed about the various terminology with respect to the peritoneum what are intraperitoneal organs retroperitoneal organs and then the extra peritoneal organs then we have discussed about the various folds and how they are labeled the nomenclature of what is momentum mesentery mesocolon then about ligaments what are the various ligaments then we have also described about certain folds lesser momentum greater momentum mesentery then followed by that we have actually traced the peritoneum vertical tracing of the peritoneum so before that we have also seen the two basic subdivisions of the peritoneal cavity into the greater sac and the lesser sac so as a continuation of the previous class in today's session i will be concentrating on the peritoneal reflection of the pelvis so last class also i have just gave a hint about it male pelvis and female pelvis how actually the peritoneum reflects on to the pelvic organs followed by that various compartments okay now the last class we have seen about the two broad subdivisions lesser and greater sac here we will be seeing about the compartments of the peritoneum supracolic and infracolic compartment then with respect to some spaces mainly i will be discussing in detail about the lesser sac so its boundaries of the lesser sac its extensions then recesses some blind space pouches or pockets about the peritoneal recesses then functions of the peritoneum and finally we will conclude with some clinical conditions or clinical aspects of the peritoneum so first coming to the peritoneum of the pelvis so here you are able to see a sagittal section so mid sagittal section of a male pelvis so in males the peritoneum reflex from the anterior abdominal wall on top of the urinary bladder so above the bladder it reflex then on the posterior surface to some extent where the seminal vesicles are present then it reflex on to the top to the front of the rectum and the space that fold of peritoneum which is present is actually called as the recto vesicular pouch between the rectum and the bladder it is called as the bladder is the vesicle recto vesicular pouch and inferiorly it will fuse with the primitive fascia or septum which is called as the recto vesicular fascia of denon villus you have a septum here 
called as the recto vesicular fascia of denon pilus then what happens is then from the rectum it passes covers the anterior aspect of the rectum in the upper part then the upper one third middle one third it is only the anterior aspect upper one third front and sides of the rectum and then from there it continues as the parietal peritoneum of the posterior abdominal wall okay now on either side on the sides of the rectum which we have seen on either side it may also lie in a space which is called as the para rectal fossa it is called as the para rectal fossa same way if you trace the rectum the peritoneum lateral on either sides of the bladder again it will form the para vesicular fossa okay it is called as the para vesicular fossa and that will again reflect to the lateral wall of the pelvis along the lateral wall of the pelvis and then above it will be continuous with the peritoneum of the abdominal wall so that is in case of the males mainly it forms the recto vesicular pouch in case of the females in the sagittal section if you look at it again we will start from the anterior abdominal wall it reflects on to the superior surface not completely but immediately it reflects on to the anterior and superior surface of the uterus so this narrow gap is actually called as the uterovesicular pouch or vesico uterine pouch from there it reflects on to the anterior and then superior surface of the uterus then it reflects on to the rectum forming a pouch which is actually called as the recto uterine pouch okay or it is also called as the douglas pouch recto uterine pouch is the fold of peritoneum which is present with the uterus and the fornix posterior wall of the vagina anteriorly posteriorly you have the anterior surface of the rectum so the coils of intestine are actually present in this recto uterine pouch it is the most dependent part of the a peritoneal cavity especially in supine position that is when you are standing or sitting in propped up not uh, sorry not the supine position so slightly when you are propped up it is called as fowler's position in that what happens is the fluid tends to collect in the recto uterine pouch so recto uterine pouch is the dependent part of the peritoneal cavity okay one area the other dependent area is the hepato renal pouch or morison's pouch which i will come to it later so uterus and passes on to the posterior surface up to the posterior fornix this is the fold of vagina posterior fold posterior fornix of vagina then forms the recto uterine pouch or douglas pouch covers the rectum the front and then it is same in case of the males as in males you can see the same the peritoneal reflection of the rectum and from there on to the posterior abdominal wall so para rectal fossa forms then para vesicular fossa if you trace it laterally on either side of the uterus it will form a double layered fold of peritoneum which is called as the broad ligament of the uterus the upper most part of the upper limit of the broad ligament of the uterus you have the uterine tube the uterine tube what happens pierces the peritoneum and then opens near the ovary so that is why in the previous class itself i told you the peritoneal cavity is a open sac in case of the females so through this ostium 
what happens it might communicate via the uterus then to the uterine cavity through the fallopian tube uterine cavity vaginal canal to the exterior so any infections from the exterior can also infect your peritoneal cavity in case of the females so that is about the reflection of the peritoneum over the pelvic viscera in case of the females next we will pass on to the subdivisions of the peritoneal compartment so what are the subdivisions of the peritoneal compartment broadly it is divided into two compartments one is the supracolic compartment and other one is the infracolic compartment so it is the transverse colon which is the structure delineating structure above the transverse colon that is why it is called as supracolic compartment below the transverse colon it is called as the infracolic compartment okay now the peritoneum is actually appreciated or studied in the supracolic and the infracolic compartment by the form of horizontal disposition so you go like this transversely you study or appreciate the peritoneum tracing it transversely vertical transposition we have seen in the last class so we will try to understand some aspects while we see it transversely okay so two compartments mainly the supracolic and the infracolic compartment above the transverse colon this complete shaded area is actually the supracolic compartment of course the transverse colon is cut here only the more lateral parts where it forms the hepatic flexure of colon and the splenic flexure of the colon is seen here so mainly you can see the reflection of peritoneum over the liver spleen of course the stomach is removed and then the anterior surface of the duodenum so peritoneal reflections in the supracolic compartment is seen or studied over the liver stomach spleen mainly these three organs and also the anterior surface of the duodenum so this is actually present anterior the supracolic compartment is present anterior to the stomach bed structures mostly what you see here is the pancreas both the kidneys the supra renal glands or the adrenal glands the supra renal glands the kidney the pancreas of course if you want you can add even the great blood vessels okay so that is about the supracolic compartment because all these structures what i told you know pancreas kidney supra renal the great blood vessels they are all retro peritoneal so in front of it only we have the peritoneal cavity that is the supracolic compartment so now what happens is in the supracolic compartment the peritoneum is actually divided into two parts the suprahepatic part and the sub hepatic part the liver intervenes in between so this is called as the supra hepatic part and then the sub hepatic supra poly compartment is actually divided that into supra and the supra hepatic and the sub hepatic so these are in the form of spaces three spaces on the right side three spaces on the left side okay so to the right of the falciform ligament to the left of the falciform ligament you can see the spaces okay so three on the right side are two intraperitoneal and one extraperitoneal space two on the left side and again it is called as the two intraperitoneal and one extraperitoneal space so whether it is supra hepatic space or whether it is sub hepatic space they are all present below the diaphragm 
So all these spaces are actually called as the subphrenic spaces. So the subphrenic spaces can be divided into right anterior, right posterior, intraperitoneal, both of them, and right extraperitoneal space. Left side in the same way, left anterior intraperitoneal, left posterior intraperitoneal, and left extraperitoneal space. Your right posterior intraperitoneal space. Okay. Your right posterior intraperitoneal space is your hepatorenal pouch or hepatorenal recess or Morrison's pouch. Again, this is a dependent part of your peritoneal cavity. What I told you is the Recto-uterine pouch in females. This is hepatorenal pouch. So, if you look at the hepatorenal pouch boundaries, anteriorly by the inferior surface of the right lobe of the liver, posteriorly by the anterior surface of kidney and right suprarenal, the peritoneum, anterior surface of kidney and the suprarenal, Posteriorly, anteriorly it is by the inferior surface of the right lobe of the liver. Inferiorly, you see, it is down, communicates with the infracolic compartment. Communicates with the infracolic compartment below. Then, above, along the inferior border of the liver, what happens? It is communicating with the right anterior intraperitoneal space. Okay. Anterior intraperitoneal space, it will communicate this above, along the right triangular ligament. If you trace it to the left side, it will communicate with the lesser sac through the epiploic foramen. So, epitorenal pouch will communicate with the epiploic foramen through the left side, through the epiploic foramen, it will communicate to the lesser sac. Below, to the infracolic compartment, mainly to the right paracolic gutter. Superiorly, it might communicate to the right anterior intraperitoneal space. This space, along the inferior border and the right triangular ligament. So, mainly fluid collects in this area in the supine position when you are lying down from the lesser sac. So, any collection of fluid in the lesser sac behind the stomach through the epiploic foramen, it might come and collect here. So, that is why it is called as the dependent part of the peritoneal cavity. So, here if you look at the horizontal disposition, mainly the peritoneal folds, you are actually able to see here, it invests the liver, then that is the stomach and the duodenum which is covered by peritoneum anteriorly and posteriorly. Then this is actually your Pancreas, which is not covered by peritoneum behind, only anteriorly it is covered. This double layered fold is the lesser sac, which you are actually seeing here, that is the lesser sac. Okay. Then you are able to see the spleen, again it is intraperitoneal, investing the spleen. And that is your colon, again. <coughs> Transverse colon will be covered by the peritoneum. Coils of intestine, mesentery covering the peritoneum front and sides. Okay. So, a transverse disposition you are able to see here. Now, we will come to the lesser sac. One of the subphrenic space, right posterior intraperitoneal space. Okay. 
sorry sorry it is the left posterior right posterior is your uh, epitorial pouch this is the left posterior intraperitoneal space behind the stomach a recess a recess behind the stomach is actually the lesser sac also called as the omental bursa anything referring to the stomach is actually called as omentum lesser omentum which is attached here greater omentum so actually it is present behind the lesser omentum omental bursa again it is an out pocketing of the greater sac so the greater sac to the epiploid foramen has just uh, formed a diverticulum behind the stomach so that is why lesser sac is actually considered as a diverticulum or an offshoot from the greater sac so it is shaped like a hot water bag i don't know how many of you have seen maybe now it is not mostly in use now all these electronic items have come the hot water bag it is made up of a rubber <coughs> so you can pour hot water and there will be a lid so that you can screw the lid and then what happens is this hot water that bag can be applied over a place where you have inflammation or swelling so the only opening in the hot water bag is the place where you pour the water so here also the lesser sac is closed on all sides except along the epiploic foramen so you are able to see when you just lift the stomach and reflect it behind you are able to see the lesser sac which is lined by the peritoneum and behind the peritoneum you are able to see the pancreas so only opening is through the epiploic foramen it will communicate with the greater sac this lesser sac will communicate with the greater sac through the opening on the right side which is called as the epiploic foramen the anterior wall of the reser sac is mainly formed by the caudate lobe of the liver lesser omentum then posterior inferior surface of stomach first two layers of greater omentum okay so this is your lesser sac caudate lobe of liver lesser omentum posterior inferior surface of stomach and first two layers of greater omentum the posterior wall is mainly formed by the third and fourth layer of greater omentum transverse mesocolon covering the transverse colon then anterior surface of pancreas of course the peritoneum reflected over it then left kidney and the suprarenal okay so that is about the anterior and the posterior wall then you also have superior wall and an inferior wall superior wall is the reflection of peritoneum over the diaphragm and inferior wall is the fusion of these second and the third layer this i have again told you that second and third layer of the puberty fuses only near to the stomach between the second and third layer there will be a small space the remaining parts of the inner two layers of the greater omentum they fuse and that small space is an extension of the lesser sac inferior recess beyond the stomach and the liver this extension is actually called as the superior recess of lesser sac you also have one more recess laterally towards the spleen it is called as the splenic recess so here again you are able to see the lesser sac behind the stomach lesser omentum and the caudate lobe of the liver first two layers from the anterior wall second and third layer from the posterior wall then transverse mesocolon covering the anterior superior surface of transverse colon then peritoneum reflecting on to the pancreas left kidney and then it is reflecting on to the diaphragm under the surface of the diaphragm so upper limit is reflection of peritoneum to the diaphragm you see the lesser sac lower sac lower limit is actually the lower fused margin of the greater omentum you don't see it such big space it is actually fused the second and third the inner two layers so there is no gap in between them so the recesses 
of the lesser sac. You have a superior recess behind the lesser momentum and the liver. Above the stomach, behind the lesser momentum and the liver, you have the superior recess. Then inferior recess between the third and fourth layer. The uppermost part where the starting point of the greater momentum, there it is not fused. The remaining part is completely fused. And that small space forms the inferior recess of the lesser sac. Then you also see an extension behind the stomach. This is the lesser sac. And you see an extension towards the spleen that is called as the splenic recess, which is between the gastrosplenic ligament and that is the lineo-renal ligament. So you all know. The spleen develops in the dorsal mesogastrium between the two layers. This dorsal mesogastrium, because spleen develops inside this, between the spleen and the stomach it becomes gastrosplenic ligament. Between the spleen and the kidney it becomes the lineo-renal ligament. So between these two. We have recesses of the lesser sac extending and it is actually called as the splenic recess. Okay, it is actually called as the splenic recess. So here you are able to see that. Next, coming to the epiploic foramen, see the free margin of the lesser momentum. Where the greater sac communicates with the lesser sac. Behind the lesser momentum, you see the lesser sac. So, in the right free margin of the lesser momentum, you see the epiploid foramen. This right free margin itself forms the anterior boundary of epiploid foramen. Anterior boundary of epiploid foramen is formed by the right free margin of lesser momentum, which contains bile duct towards the right side. Hepatic artery towards the left side and portal wing behind these two. So they form the anterior boundary of the lesser sac. Bile duct, hepatic artery, and portal wing in the right free margin of the lesser sac. Posteriorly, it will be bounded by the IVC, inferior vena cava. Of course, it is not seen here. Once you remove this, you will see. Inferiorly, the first part of duodenum and superiorly caudate process of liver okay caudate process of the caudate lobe of the liver forms the superior boundary okay caudate process of the caudate lobe of the liver inferiorly it is the superior surface of the first part of the duodenum so those are the boundaries of the epiploic foramen which communicates or the opening or communication between the greater sac and the lesser sac. Now, you are able to see the peritoneal reflections of the liver. So, you will try to understand certain concepts of the peritoneal reflections of the liver. This is the falciform ligament which is extending from the anterior abdominal wall. It is attached here to the liver, the anterior surface and divides the liver into the right lobe and the left lobe, but they are not physiological right and left lobes. Then the falciform ligament divides into right side and left side. On the posterior margin of the falciform ligament, we have the ligamentum teres, which is the obliterated left umbilical vein. Ligamentum teres is obliterated left umbilical vein. So, falciform ligament divides into a right layer and the left layer. So, this is the right and the left layer. If you trace the right layer, peritoneum from above the diaphragm will reflect and forms the upper or superior layer of coronary ligament. It is called as the superior layer of coronary ligament. Then peritoneum after reflecting form covers the anterior surface, then it covers the inferior surface, anterior surface and then covers the inferior surface. After that it reflects as the inferior layer of coronary ligament here. Sorry I was showing you the left side. 
inferior layer of coronary ligament okay so superior layer of coronary ligament above you are able to see here inferior layer will be below superior and inferior between these two layers only what you see is the bare area of the liver if you trace the inferior layer of coronary ligament so somewhere here if you trace it more towards the right side it will form the right triangular ligament after joining with the superior layer if you trace it to the left of the right triangular ligament it will reflect below it will reflect below in front of the second part of duodenum right kidney right suprarenal gland as the hepatorenal pouch and more below if you trace it it will go into the infracolic compartment to the infracolic compartment now if you trace it to the left it will form the lining over the groove for the inferior vena cava groove for the inferior vena cava then afterwards it will form the right lip of the porta hepatis come around the porta hepatis and then it will form the left lip and then it is continuous with the left triangular ligament what is left triangular ligament is the left layer of falciform ligament and peritoneum from the reflecting from top from the under surface of the diaphragm they will form the anterior layer okay anterior layer and the anterior layer will join laterally to form the left triangular ligament anterior layer of the left coronary ligament or you call it as the left triangular ligament finally okay then what happens it will continue to line the inferior surface of the left lobe of the liver this is your uh, caudate lobe this is your quadrate lobe then covers the inferior surface of the gall bladder also the peritoneum so mainly you try to understand the falciform ligament coronary ligament superior layer left triangular ligament inferior layer between the superior layer and the inferior layer superior and inferior layer of the coronary ligament we have the bare area and the right triangular ligament okay so this attachment is actually the lesser omentum lesser omentum it has got a transverse part and a vertical part around the porta hepatis and the groove for ligamentum venosum okay so that is the attachment of the lesser omentum so now so here you are able to see the whole of the liver is actually lined by the greater sac except the caudate process and the process of the liver which is actually lined by the peritoneum of the lesser sac groove for ibc and porta hepatis and the lower part of the caudate process are all lined by the peritoneum of the lesser sac so here you are able to see the lesser sac so which will lie along the ibc i told you then the left lip of the ligamentum venosum and the caudate lobe of the liver Coming to the infracolic compartment below the transverse colon, you are able to see the infracolic compartment which is divided right and left by the mesentery, border above by the <coughs> transverse colon, and on either side by the ascending and the descending colon, ascending and the descending colon. So mainly the infracolic compartment contains the coils of jejunum and ileum. with their peritoneal fold which is the mesentery so that mesentery divides the infracolic compartment into a right infracolic space which is roughly triangular in shape between the ascending colon and the right border or the right layer of the mesentery below you have ileocecal junction so it does not extend below into the peritoneal cavity the right infracolic space which is roughly triangular whereas the left intracolic space 
is somewhat larger and not triangular but quadrangular in shape roughly it is open below so that way it communicates with the pelvic peritoneum okay the left layer it is bordered by the left layer and the descending colon and above by the ascending colon below it is continuous that is the left infracolic space on lateral to the greater sorry the ascending colon and the descending colon you have the paracolic gutters the left paracolic gutter and the right paracolic gutter now if you horizontally trace the peritoneum let us start from the mesentery left or right layer of mesentery passes in front lining the posterior abdominal wall structures then front of the ascending colon paracolic gutter then lines the anterior abdominal wall like a round it comes anterior abdominal wall then it comes forms the left paracolic gutter peritoneum in front of the descending colon then peritoneum the posterior abdominal wall and then reflex as the left layer of the mesentery that is the tracing of the infracolic compartment which is fairly easier than the peritoneal tracings of the supracolic compartment so left paracolic gutter communicates with the peritoneum of the pelvic cavity but above there is left colic flexure to the diaphragm you have the phrenico colic ligament so it does not extend above now what are peritoneal recesses mostly you see this peritoneal recess where the organs become retroperitoneal to peritoneal or you can tell vice versa from peritoneal to retroperitoneal so mainly around the duodenum especially between the third and fourth part duodeno jejunal flexure continues as the duodenum continuing as the jejunum so it raises a fold of peritoneum thereby you see blind pouches or pockets on either side you have the para duodenal fossa then you have the superior and inferior duodenal fossa superior duodenal fossa is facing downwards inferior duodenal fossa is actually facing upwards then on either side you have the para duodenal fossa they are actually the recesses which is present around the duodeno jejunal flexure now one main thing is the clinically it is important because any loops of intestine might get herniated into this or sometimes they might also get strangulated the remaining recess mainly you see with respect to the cecum behind the cecum you have the retrocecal recess so most commonly your appendix might be seen in the retrocecal position in this recess retrocecal recess behind the cecum and you also have superior and inferior cecal recess because again from here it is going to become retroperitoneal the ascending remaining part of ascending colon so you have a recess so naturally the next recess should be with respect to the sigmoid colon called as intersigmoid recess then we have already seen well about the recesses of the lesser sac superior recess inferior recess and then the splenic recess of the recess of the lesser sac so they are all sites of internal herniation loops of intestine might get stuck inside these blind pockets and if they are compressed they will produce strangulation and if the blood supply is compromised to this uh, strangulated or herniated part of intestine then it is a serious condition so strangulation might take place so that is the intersigmoidal recess which you are able to see between the sigmoid meso colon so peritoneal force most of the peritoneal force ligaments all we have discussed about the visceral peritoneum with respect to the parietal peritoneum there are certain forms which you are able to see on the internal aspect of the anterior abdominal wall median umbilical ligament covered by the peritoneal fold median umbilical ligament is actually uracus remnant of uracus 
Then you have the medial umbilical ligament, which is the obliterated umbilical artery. A pair, what is the median, what is the singular? On either side, a pair of medial umbilical ligament covered by fold of peritoneum. Medial umbilical ligament is obliterated umbilical arteries. Then, lateral thing, you have lateral umbilical folds. The fold which is present on the inferior epigastric artery, pair of lateral umbilical folds on the inferior epigastric artery. Now, the space between the median and median is actually called as the supravesicular fossa. Between the median and lateral is called as the medial inguinal fossa. Lateral to the lateral foot is actually called as the lateral inguinal fossa. Supravesicular fossa, medial inguinal fossa, and lateral inguinal fossa. So, between the median and lateral inguinal fossa, herniation takes place in the inguinal canal. So, mostly the direct inguinal hernias, they take place through this medial or lateral inguinal fossa. So, a quick look at the functions of the peritoneum, mainly because these folds are there. So, the coils of intestines are actually suspended because of the mesentery. So, it allows free movement of the viscera. Motility and all is not uh, hindered or it is restricted. Then, peritoneal fluid is there. So, naturally, it reduces friction. Guards against the phagocytic infections by the Guardians, guardians is actually given by the phagocytic cells, especially the greater momentum, which like an abron covers the coils of intestine. You have certain this phagocytic cells, macrophages, they are present called as milky spots. The site of infection, they will move, these phagocytic cells will go and concentrate there and they will form adhesions so that the infection does not spread. So, that is why the greater momentum is also called as the policeman of the abdomen. Then, large surface area for absorption of fluid. Storage of fat, mesentery has got a considerable amount of fat and even you can see the greater momentum, lot of fat is actually present. So, by wrapping around the inflamed site, it prevents the spread of infection. So, that is why the greater momentum is actually called as the policeman of the abdomen. Clinical aspects, collection of fluid inside the peritoneal cavity is called as ascites, mainly you see ascites in the cirrhosis of the liver, most common condition. Then actually the fluid has to be drained. The procedure is actually called as the parasynthesis of the oven. So, draining excess fluid. So, usually the drainage is the anterior midline or on the flank laterally. On either side, it is actually called as the flank. Collection of blood instead of fluid, it is called as hemoperitoneum. You also have collection of air, which is called as pneumoperitoneum. So, artificial pneumoperitoneum is introduction of air in bilateral lung tuberculosis. So, you introduce air, so thereby into the peritoneal cavity. So, the peritoneal cavity will get inflated, so it rests the lung. So, the lung won't exert up and down during the respiratory movements. So, here you are able to see a faint mark, the semilunar shaped space here. Radio lucent, so that is actually pneumoperitoneum, air in the peritoneal cavity. Peritonitis before that peritoneal dialysis. So, in case of patients with renal failure, so the excess waste products are actually removed to the peritoneum. So, it is called as peritoneal dialysis. The other one is the hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis in patients with renal failure. Inflammation of the peritoneum is actually called as peritonitis. It might be localized inflammation or generalized localized peritonitis or generalized peritonitis. 
So localized peritonitis, what happens is you have pain over local area that inflamed area. So surface of any viscera involved, anterior to the stomach or anterior to the spleen, liver, coils of intestine. Then on pressure there will be tenderness and what happens is stiffness will be there because the parietal muscles abdominal wall muscles they might go for spasm. So that is localized peritonitis. Generalized peritonitis is a very again critical or a what do you call complicated uh, condition. What is rupture of the gangrenous appendix or perforation of the posterior wall of the stomach from there what happens is fluid might enter into the lesser sac, from the lesser sac it might come to the hepatorenal pouch, from there what happens it might enter into the infrapolic compartment, so it might spread everywhere forming general peritonitis. So pain, tenderness and rigidity, general peritonitis what happens it will give a cardboard appearance, very stiff, your anterior abdominal wall will be very stiff, you will not hear any gas sounds. No resonating sounds, no tympanic confusion, all this in the upper abdomen if you see, you will experience in case of the generalized peritonitis. So in generalized peritonitis as I told you prognosis is very poor because infections will spread throughout the peritoneal cavity and it might spread to all the organs. If it is suspected then opening of the peritoneal cavity, laparotomy should be avoided. So most dependent areas I already told you what is the rectouterine pouch, other one is the hepatorenal pouch. So these two in supine position <coughs> and mostly the hepatorenal pouch, infections due to ascites or any collection of fluid following a surgery or perforation of the posterior wall of the stomach in case of very chronic ulcer, severe ulcer patients. In upright or fowler's position, so at 45 degrees angle, what happens is the patient is propped up. This is because the peritone, the fluid might slowly come and collect in the pelvic cavity and the absorption of this fluid in the pelvic cavity is slow. So that is why what happens is, this is actually recommended Fowler's position following a surgery or to drain the excess fluid into the pelvic cavity, slowly it comes there and stays. But one thing is it might be uncomfortable to the patient. And second thing what happens is since the patient post surgery might feel or experience breathing difficulties because the lung cannot act very actively or efficiently. So lesser sac inflammation, fluid collection in the lesser sac is mainly due to perforation of the peptic ulcer. So that is the stomach. So behind the stomach you are able to see collection of fluid which is shown as the red spot mainly due to perforation of peptic ulcer or acute peritonitis or pseudocyst of pancreas. Acute pancreatitis or pseudocyst of the pancreas they also will actually what do is what they do is collection of fluid in the lesser sac. Okay? So in two cases, acute pancreatitis and the pseudocyst of the pancreas. <coughs> Internal herniation of the loops also might take place into this lesser sac through the epiploic foramen. So with this, I complete the class on the peritoneum. Thank you very much for your patient listening.